Well, hello, this is Mike Tillerson on a Wednesday at right the Senior Center. Claire Taylor is here on the Alzheimer's Association, and he's going to be doing our presentation. So if you're giving your attention, that would be more than welcome. You know what? My whole time, I have to all right, can everybody hear me all right? Well, up a little bit? Is it up? How's that? So I'll just get my lips real close to it while you guys can hear me. Um, I have somebody who's helping me pass on some of the pamphlets. If you guys have gotten those, uh, those are going to be similar to the information that I'm presenting on, but you'll just be able to take it home with you and share it with somebody else. Um, or continue to read it at your place. Like she said, I'm from the Alzheimer's Association. So today I'm presenting on the 10 signs. So if you or anybody you know um, is displaying some of these, um, then I would uh, encourage, them to, encourage you to get them to a doctor so that we can find out if it is actually Alzheimer's or dementia that they might be suffering from. So this is a good educational program. Hopefully you guys will enjoy. Um, and then I do have a sign-in sheet here just to show my boss that people actually showed up. Um, if you could at least put just your last name and then the zip code. It says zip code of employment, but you can just put zip code of where you live and you will in no way get any solicitation from us. I just need a last name and uh, zip code. So if you could do that, I'll pass it around and I'll give you my pen. This is my favorite pen though, so hopefully I get it back. We'll see. Oh yeah. And I don't usually, if I remember. All right. So I'll, I'll need some help. That was a joke. <laughs> Did everybody get a pamphlet that needs one? Yes. You need some? Okay. All right, well, I'm going to get started. Um, so my name is Taylor Kramer. I'm a program coordinator with the Alzheimer's Association. And is this making funny noises or is it okay? Um, so part of my job is traveling to different facilities and giving what we call education programs. So it's just a way of getting general knowledge about dementia or Alzheimer's out to the public. And so like I said, today is uh, knowing the 10 signs and the importance of early detection. So I'll just go ahead and get started. I'm a pretty informal person, so if you have a question, you can just yell it out at me and I'll try my best to answer it. Otherwise, I can talk uh, with you guys at the end. This uh, first slide is just a quote from someone. Uh, it says, if we could have had a correct diagnosis even two years earlier, it would have given us more time to plan, to do things that can result in a good quality of life, and to accomplish things we always wanted to do that got put off for this reason or that. So that's a quote from someone whose name is Jay Smith. The wife, his wife, Patty, was diagnosed two years after the onset of symptoms. So his quote there, what he's saying is they noticed some changes for two years before they actually got a diagnosis, and he's really wishing that he had gotten that diagnosis earlier so they could have started to plan for it. I got a question to ask you. Yeah. What is Alzheimer's? Yeah, we'll get to that too. Oh, well, I think right. you start off that first, but then you go. Yeah, it. let me see how, and I'll, I'll get to it. Okay. Uh, it is near the beginning. All right. <coughs> All right, so you would ask what is Alzheimer's? Yeah. Yeah, so Alzheimer's is a form of dementia. A lot of times people um, use those words interchangeably, which is okay, um, but dementia is the main term. Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia that falls under that umbrella term of dementia. And so uh, if someone sometimes says, well, I have a dementia diagnosis, they don't know what kind of dementia. Um, then that may be because the diagnosis hasn't gotten quite specific enough yet to determine what actual kind of dementia it is, but Alzheimer's is the most common, so you're going to hear about that one the most often. Yeah. What's, what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? Yeah, so Alzheimer's, that to me, please. yeah so Alzheimer's is just a form of dementia. So dementia is the main term, and Alzheimer's is just a form of that. Form of what? Of dementia. 
All right. Next slide is Alzheimer's disease versus typical aging. We're going to look at some myths and some realities. So a myth would be that having a little touch of dementia is a typical part of aging. A lot of people can think that as you get older, dementia is just common with age, um, and at times it is. But there's a difference between some memory changes that take place normal, normally, and then those that are due to dementia. So as we age, many of our physical capabilities, including memory, diminish. But having a harder time remembering some things is very different from having a form of dementia like Alzheimer's disease. Here's your slide, sir. So what is Alzheimer's disease? Uh, it is a progressive disease of the brain that destroys brain cells. Many people have trouble with memory loss, but it doesn't always mean that they have Alzheimer's disease. In fact, most people do not. But it is best to visit a doctor to determine the cause of the memory loss symptoms. So if you know of someone who's maybe experiencing some memory loss, that's why we always push them to go to the doctor because it could even be something as simple as just maybe some medication reactions or things like that too. And so that's why we seek that diagnosis. Hello. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. The primary risk factor is age. So that just means that the older you get, the incidence is higher, and more specifically in women. But that's really just due to the fact that women live longer. Another myth is that if Alzheimer's disease runs in your family, genetic testing will tell you whether you will get Alzheimer's disease too. The reality to that is having a parent or a sibling with Alzheimer's disease can increase uh, the chances of developing the disease, but genetics is not the only risk factor. So I get a lot of people that are, I'm gonna move this chair real quick, that um, are concerned because they say my, my mother had Alzheimer's, I think I'm gonna have Alzheimer's too. It can increase the risk, but it's still not a guarantee. So I try to calm people down a little bit in that sense. So the gene APOE E4 is linked to greater risk of late onset Alzheimer's disease. This type of dementia is most common and associated with old age. Once again, that's Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's a good idea to discuss benefits and risks of testing with a physician or a genetic counselor. Having this gene, like I said, will only increase your chance of developing Alzheimer's disease. It cannot predict whether you'll get it, and I think that that's frustrating for a lot of people. They would like to, some of us would probably like to know. Maybe others would just as soon not know. Um, I think it probably depends on the person. But they can tell you um, if your chances are increased, but they cannot tell you, yes, for certain you're gonna develop it in the future. Body-brain connection. Brain health comes from a healthy body, learning new things, healthy eating, and an active social life. And that's why I like coming to facilities like this because I think just being here, you're engaging in social activity, and that's really important. Um, risk for Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia is increased by a damaged heart or blood vessel. Diabetes in midlife can lead to Alzheimer's disease decades later. And there is a strong link between serious head injury and risk for dementia. So what I would focus on with that slide is that um, risk for Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia can be uh, increased due to poor heart health. So we need to make sure that we're doing things to continue to take care of our heart. The rule is what's good for your heart is good for your brain. So that's just a good rule of thumb. What, excuse me, what, what is the letter AD stand for? I'm sorry, Alzheimer's disease. Oh, yep. I'm sorry, okay. No, that's okay. Now we're moving on to the 10 warning signs, so this is the meat of the presentation. Number one, memory changes that disrupt daily life. So examples of that could be forgetting something that uh, was recently learned, asking the same information over and over, repeating oneself, uh, relying on memory aids or family members for things that people used to handle alone. And again, not just one or even a couple of these, we're covering 10 of them, is not going to be a clear indicator but I just want to give people an idea of what it may look like. And if there's a lot of these boxes that are being uh, ticked off, then um, it may be something that needs to be looked into. We're probably going to all have examples of where we've struggled with some of these. So I don't want people to get too concerned. Number two is challenges in planning or solving problems. So that could be problems developing or following a plan. 
Problems working with numbers, math can start to get a little more difficult. Problems following a familiar recipe, so an example could be someone who's made the same batch of cookies or the same apple pie their whole life, and they always follow the same recipe, and if that starts to become difficult, that could be a sign. Uh, difficulty keeping track of bills, that can also be related to, um, you know, maybe some of the math is getting a little more confusing, things like that. Uh, challenges is concentrating or even taking longer than before to do common tasks. Number three is difficulty completing familiar tasks. So that could be things like daily tasks. Daily tasks would be things that really all of us do on a daily basis, whether that would be brushing our teeth or bathing. Um, so if there starts to be some difficulty completing those things. Um, trouble driving to once familiar places. Problems managing a budget at work or difficulty remembering the words, or the rules, I'm sorry, of a favorite game. Number four is confusion with time or place. So that could be losing track of dates, seasons, and the passage of time. So we're talking um, losing track of large periods of time. So not just maybe having the difficulty of recalling what day it is specifically, but maybe thinking that it's the winter when really it's the spring or, or that it's summer when really it's the fall. Um, forgetting where one is or how one got there. Hmm. And number five is trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships. So that means there's a diminished ability to track visual surroundings. So that could uh, include difficulty reading, trouble judging distance, problems determining color or contrast. I think we probably all heard of people, excuse me, who um, have dementia and they can no longer drive safely. A lot of times, um, at least for me, I assumed it was because they were forgetting how to drive. So that meant they were accidentally pushing the brake when they needed the gas. That's actually not the case. A lot of it is that their brain can no longer uh, understand the distance between intersections or the car in front of them or maybe even um, can't pick up the color of the stop signs as easily or things like that. So I thought that's interesting information. Number six is new problems with words and speaking or writing. So problems following or joining a conversation. Number seven, uh, misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace steps. So examples of that could be putting things in unusual places. So like an example they give is a wallet and a fruit bowl, but really just trying to understand that if there's a place where someone has always put something. So I think we all probably have a usual spot where we put our keys or our wallet. Um, and then for some reason, finding it in the refrigerator um, could be, could be uh, an idea of what that looks like. Uh, having increasing uh, difficulty retracing steps to locate a missing item. So not only missing an item, but just not even being able to recall when the last time they had that item was. Um, and this can often look like accusing others of stealing. So that can be uh, hard for some people to take because you know we're all honest people here and so it'd be difficult to uh, get accused of stealing if that's something that we've never done before. And really that's just because in their mind, um, they're so certain that they've followed their usual routine of putting things away. And if they haven't, then what choice do they have but to think that maybe somebody stole something from them, right? So if, that, if you ever get accused of stealing and you didn't, don't take it too personal. But if you did steal, you should give it back. Uh, number eight, uh, decreased or poor judgment. So changes in decision making and judgment. Maybe poor judgment with money. So that could look like giving large amounts of money to telemarketers. I'm sure we all get harassed by telemarketers quite a bit. Um, so maybe uh, before someone would just have no problem hanging up on those people. Now maybe they're starting to think, well, those deals or whatever they're talking about sound pretty good. Uh, maybe I'll give them some money. Uh, spending more impulsively, so not thinking about it so much and just spending large amounts of money. Um, or wearing clothing inappropriate to the weather or season, so wearing shorts in the winter um, or, or a heavy jacket in the, in the summer. Except for Florida. Right. And number nine, withdrawal from work or social activities. So this might be uh, something for you guys to keep in mind. I assume there's a lot of activities that go on at, at this facility. So if you're noticing that someone is uh, withdrawing from certain hobbies or social activities, uh, work projects, family gatherings. So if there's somebody um, that you see who used to be right in the middle of every conversation or every activity, 
and now all of a sudden they don't seem so comfortable in those settings anymore, that could give you an idea that maybe something's going on. Um, losing track of a favorite sports team, somebody always follows the Tigers for the last 50 years and now they just have no interest, could also uh, be a hint. Forgetting how to engage in a favorite hobby um, and avoiding social situations. That, that could be a clear sign if someone is just no longer comfortable in those situations because maybe the room is getting too loud and so they don't know how to communicate uh, properly in a room like that anymore, then that could uh, definitely give you an idea too. And lastly, number 10, uh, changes in mood and personality. So increasingly displaying signs of confusion, suspicion, so that's kind of back to um, accusing someone of stealing, fear, anxiety, or agitation. So any mood and personality changes that just aren't normal to, to how they usually are. So what should I do if I see some of the 10 signs? Uh, you're going to want to talk with people about what you're seeing and thinking. So if you have a close friend, don't just assume on your own. Maybe go talk to some of your other friends and see if they've noticed some of the similar things so you guys can bounce ideas off of each other. Um, encourage the person that you're concerned about to get to the doctor. We want to work on that early diagnosis. And then get the right treatment as soon as possible. That's really crucial, right? We all want to know what we're up against. It would be very scary to have to seek out a diagnosis. Some people would just as soon not know and maybe push it under the rug. But we don't typically do that with other illnesses or diseases, so we really don't want to do that with Alzheimer's disease either. Back to a myth versus reality. Uh, the myth is that there's no point in getting diagnosed because dementia is not curable or treatable. It'll just upset me and my family, so why do it? Uh, the reality is early diagnosis is the only way to get early treatment for any diagnosis. And notice there it says any diagnosis and not just an Alzheimer's diagnosis. That's because um, we want to get people in to see the doctor because what if it is just a reaction to a medication or um, some other illness that can, be, that can be cured and so it would clear up those symptoms. So uh, that's why we always push people to get to the doctor even though it's, it's scary and uncomfortable because it could just as easily be something else that could be fixed. Yeah, I'm pretty good, I'm jumping ahead here on my own, I guess. Um, so it might not be Alzheimer's or dementia at all. Uh, some detected problems can be treated or reversed. Some can be, oh, no. some can be life-threatening if not detected or treated promptly. And it's important not to ignore changes or just assume that it is Alzheimer's and just try to deal with it without any medical help. I think I figured out the mic, I have to hold the bottom. Yeah. Now that we're almost done, I figured it out. Another myth versus reality, uh, you don't need a complete set of diagnostic tests to know if you have Alzheimer's disease. You can just try a medication for memory loss and if it works, then you know. Uh, in reality, early treatment is best, but you have to know what you're treating in order for medications to work. Uh, there are many things that can cause memory loss and it's important to be thoroughly assessed, so making sure um, that the doctor is putting you through as many assessments as they're capable of, or maybe going to see a specialist if you're able, um, is really important. And I always just tell people, just start with your family doctor if there's concerns, uh, share with them uh, some of those concerns and see what they say, and then if you have the ability to maybe travel um, to a bigger city or wherever it is to see a neurologist or whoever, um, then do that if you can. Diagnostic steps can look like this. They'll take a history from the patient, close family, and or friends. And that's why it's really important to have uh, family or friends involved because they may notice some changes that the person themselves are not noticing. And so to get everybody's opinion on that is really important. Uh, there will be a physical exam, a mental status exam, a neurological exam, and there can even be brain scans. Again, that's just going to depend on the person and how far up the ladder of doctors they want to take it. What's a neurological exam? So that's going to more be um, more specific to like a neurologist and some of the capabilities that they would have of actually testing the functions of the brain, whereas a family doctor is going to be a little more limited in what they can do. So it may just more be questionnaires or seeing if there's um, maybe any mental illnesses that it could be attributed to and things like that. Just a more complicated exam that will give you a better idea of what you're up against. Um, but not everybody continues to take it up the ladder of doctors. You're going to be talking about different types of medications to take. I'm, I'm 
prescribed or unprescribed, non-prescribed. As far as what? I mean, there's one example of Provigen on, on TV. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. What was that medication? Provigen. Okay. It's yeah. an extract from jellyfish. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It's difficult to tell just because uh, on TV it can be hard to believe every product that they're selling on there. So again, it just comes down to asking the doctor. I can't play doctor up here um, as much as I'd like to. So it, it just depends on getting to them because they have a better background of actual medications and they will be able to tell you, yeah, that advertisement you saw on TV is bunk, <laughs> or yeah, you should go. There's, there's generic forms also. Right. Besides probably good. Right. I mean, there's one, for example, Myers $32. They got something at Walgreens that's uh, generic $19 for a 30 day supply. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That, that's tough to tell as far as I know a lot of medications have generic, uh, more affordable versions too, and a lot of them will probably have the same active ingredients and do a lot of the same things. Again, I would just say ask the pharmacist if they have a recommendation too, because okay. um, they're going to have a much better background of actual medications, um, or, or the doctor. I think it might be easier just to go in and talk to a pharmacist than it would be a doctor. doctor but, just talk to the pharmacist. Right, the yeah. Doctor. Yep, they're going to have a lot of good information for you too. Excuse me, uh, on the test, uh, does Medicare cover any of this? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I can get you that answer if you'd like. So let me take down your information after and I can get you that information. All right, yep. Good question. All right, so physician's tests can identify disorders that may cause memory loss. So things like confused thinking, trouble focusing, attention, or other symptoms similar to dementia. Uh, possible disorders uh, that are not Alzheimer's disease or dementia could be anemia or certain vitamin deficiencies, uh, excessive use of alcohol, medication side effects, or even certain infections. So again, that's why we say to get, yeah. Uh, a lot of people think that if they get an MRI, the doctor orders an MRI, that will show dementia. Right. That is not so. Uh, my husband's case, they had to do a PET scan. The yeah. PET scan was a different kind of scan, but it showed what we needed to know. Right. Yeah, I, you're exactly right. Um, I think there's a little bit of a benefit to like an MRI, but it's not as detailed or specific as what some of those other scans would be. And so. I, you know, if, if everybody has the opportunity to take it to more specific doctors, more specific tests, then do it. I understand that not everybody has support to where they can get out of town and go to these specialists and things like that. Um, and so sometimes people are forced to rely on whatever tests they can um, be given. But yeah, if you can get kind of, like I say, go up the ladder as high as you can, then, then it's all the better. These are just some other forms of dementia, uh, vascular dementia, mixed dementia, uh, FTLD, uh, and dementia with Lewy bodies, formerly called uh, Lewy body dementia. What is FTLD? So that's uh, more of up here. So that's gonna affect a little bit more of like the personality of the person. And dementia with Lewy bodies is um, similar to Parkinson's disease in the sense that it's opposite of Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is more gonna be um, difficulty controlling movement. Uh, Lewy bodies is, um, I'm trying to remember this exactly. Lewy bodies can have some other um, symptoms that could be things like hallucinations. Those are much more rare, uh, but those are other forms of dementia. Sir, yeah? I, I knew an elderly lady a few years ago that was diagnosed with that Lewy body disease and yeah. I'd never heard of it, but all of a sudden it was an onset of like she was losing all muscle control and was always falling down. Right. She had to have something like a wheelchair, but almost like a little training walker for her child. Yeah. Because her legs and stuff wouldn't support her, so she's always falling and real weak. Yeah. Very weak. Yeah, exactly. That. Yeah, that's what I mean by uh, similar to Parkinson's. With Parkinson's, a lot of the brain function can stay intact. You'll notice more of the physical capabilities yeah. diminishing. Lewy bodies is a little bit more the opposite. You'll see some of those um, kind of mental cognition first, and then some of the, the physical okay. stuff. Yeah. Where did Parkinson come from? What the name? The Dr. Parkinson or what? That's a good question. I'll have to take your information down too and, and get you that answer. Two of us think it was. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, if you do get diagnosed with dementia, um, with early diagnosis, you can get the maximum benefit from all available treatments. So explore treatments to provide a relief in symptoms. Uh, early treatment may help individuals remain independent longer, and that's what we're seeking. Um, and that offers opportunity to even participate in clinical trials. So if clinical trials were something that you're interested in, I have access to information about those too. Um, then you can also let me know. These are some medications that are available. Uh, some medications are designed to help relieve some of the symptoms, but they don't actually stop the progression. Uh, so those could be cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, receptor antagonists may temporarily improve symptoms. Uh, other medications can also help with mood and behavior changes. So talk to the doctor about what treatment is best. So with medications, again, it's gonna more be symptom-based. So if there's certain anxieties um, that are taking place for that person, then the doctor may look and see how to manage the anxiety and it can actually then in turn improve memory function for a little bit as well. Um, they're kind of all interrelated in the sense that there's high levels of stress or if there's depression or anxiety taking place, someone's memory can get a lot worse and then if those other things can be managed then their memory can actually improve for a little bit too. Also with early diagnosis, you can have more time to consider and plan for the future. So participating and arranging your own care is very important. Things like living arrangements, safety, financial and legal matters, and transportation. Uh, you can be empowered to make decisions and then build the right care team and social network. So this slide is more geared towards the individual themselves that's getting the diagnosis to get the diagnosis earlier so that you can then participate in your own care and you're not having to depend on other people to make your decisions for you because they may not always know exactly what you want. Plan for the future, so seek legal advice and services, identify and complete legal documents, make plans for medical and legal <laughs> decisions, uh, make plans for finances and property, and then naming a person to make decisions on your behalf when you no longer can is important. So obviously somebody that you trust. And these are just different ways to contact us. Um, a lot of the same information is going to be on the back of the pamphlets or I do have a couple of my contact cards um, that I can pass out to you uh, as well. Just feel free to come up and speak with me or grab one. I think that's the last slide. So I appreciate you guys having me. Are there any other questions or stories or comments? Anybody? Yeah. Nowadays, sometimes your doctor, I just went to my doctor for school, and they give you a dementia test. Okay, yeah. Just with the regular physical? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, so she said you, you just went for a regular exam, so and, well, and they did well, a... Yes, and they, they do a small test, and, and you know, they help determine what you do. Okay. What if, do you mind if I ask what the test looked like? like well, what, the what they do is they'll ask you, like, they'll say, apple and fence. Mm -hmm. Now you have to remember that. And okay. She'll start saying yep. three numbers, three numbers, and then she'll say four. Want you to repeat them back backwards, and then she'll come back and say, "Ah, uh, now what was that? I told you to begin with." All right. Yeah. Yep. So that would be. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. That would make sense. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I think that that must be uh, becoming more common. And I think a lot of it too could be uh, related to the fact of there's so many baby boomers that are all aging at the same time that they expect there's going to be a major influx and a large population of people all suffering from Alzheimer's or dementia at the same time. And so they're worried about how that's going to affect some of the medical care and things like that too. Is there anything else? All right. Well, like I said, I'll be here uh, for a couple minutes packing up, so if you'd like to come speak with me, you can, and I appreciate you guys for having me. Thank you.